Greetings, fellow time travellers. Uh, as always, I say hand on heart that it's great to have you with me as we travel through space and time together. This is a journey for the many, not for the few. This week, you know, it's all about history. It's all about contemplating the past and wondering if what's happening now has happened before, and if so, how did they deal with it in their own time and with their own resources? Uh, I'm going to be contemplating money. Whatever you think, whatever you think of when you hear the word money, whether you think of the the notes and coins in a pocket, or access to money via a plastic card in a wallet, or or the future of money. Central bank digital currencies, the reality of the fiat money that we live in, where bankers are empowered to create money out of nowhere and then tell people that, they, that they're in debt. <laughs> it's genius. You know, love of money is the root of all evil, as it says in the, in the good book. And money is power. If you've got it, you've got power. Um, and I, I would say paying attention to the history of money, the evolution of money, has never been more important than it is today because we're on the cusp of something, we're on the cusp of change. And before we go into the new, you'd be better off understanding the present and the past. Uh, we'll be looking at the Yap archipelago, which I'm prepared to bet most people have never contemplated. Certainly couldn't point at it on a map. Uh, we'll be in Cappadocia as well, uh, as we contemplate origins of, 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 uh, of transferable wealth. Um, and we'll also be looking at the first money in circulation in in America, North America. But before we get started on today's episode, big thanks as always to those who support Paul and I and this podcast series and everything else that surrounds it via the patreon.com site. It's the finances coming through Patreon that enable, that keep the wheels on the wagon and let us do what we do. And so if you're already there and you're already contributing, thank you. If you're not a Patreon member yet, and it would make an enormous difference if you would become one. Uh, go to patreon.com, search for me by name, pay a small subscription fee. You can pay monthly or annually, and it's cheaper if you jump in with the whole year up front. But however you do it, it'll be all gratefully received. Uh, as well as supporting the series, uh, which is a, a, a an act of philanthropy, <laughs> you'll get access to, in your own right, exclusive material, first look at things, question and answer sessions, competitions, so on and so on. Anyway, I'll hope to see you there one way or another. Now it's time to strap into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop in my love letter to the world. My love letter to the world. Recorder, microphone, action. If these guys were to sort of go to the bank and say, give me my money, no bank could. These guys are worth hundreds of billions of pounds. The strange and elusive magic of money. Beautiful, hand-carved, circular stones, transported hundreds of miles across dangerous open ocean, valued for the stories they tell. Captivating wampum, strings of transformed American seashells, mesmerising bars of glinting silver from Asia Minor. Early on, the ancients grasped the essential, invisible value of money. And thousands of years later, in the 21st century, these fundamental principles still ricochet and echo across the modern financial world. Understanding history to try and illuminate the future. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the world. In the last episode, we sat beside brilliant Egyptian bureaucrats as they made some of the wonders of the world happen. Which moment in history are we eavesdropping on today? Hello Paul, yes, last week we were with the ancient Egyptian office workers as they kept track of where the money was. This week we're eavesdropping on the moment our ancestors were grappling with the very concept of money itself. We're not just in one place, we're travelling all over the globe, from the Yap Archipelago in the Western Pacific Ocean to America 
and then on to the incredible landscapes of Cappadocia in modern day Turkey. Money really does make the world go round. We're in a, a, a region uh, described uh, in the history books, at least, as Cappadocia, which is part of, uh, well, again, what the it's a, possibly an unfamiliar term now, but Asia Minor. Let's call it, a, it's like Turkey. That's the specific destination for what we're going to call the moment, the moment uh, in history this week. This being a story of the world, I've deliberately sought to make it as wide-ranging and as global in its reach as I could manage. So we'll get to Cappadocia, uh, but we're not there quite yet. The idea this week is about, well, it money, or perhaps more accurately, wealth. Y- you know, there's a difference between money, you know, the folding bits of paper that, well, it, it, well... <laughs> People are carrying less and less money, truth to tell. But there's a difference between money and wealth. I kind of visualise it or conceptualise it as the difference between a menu and a steak. You know, you walk into a restaurant and you see the food available described there. And maybe there's a steak and chips and peppercorn sauce. But there's a queer difference between that and the piece of meat that you can actually eat. So money is like a, a, a notional representation of reference to something that exists somewhere else, which is actual value, something that a person can really use. There's also an idea of proof of work. Money or a, or a cheque or a, a promissory note or, or any one of a number of financial instruments, the indicate and are connected to proof of work which is to say a silver ingot a bar of silver as well as being physically attractive its value comes from well its rarity its relative scarcity on planet earth compared to other elements and also a silver bar you could use that to make jewelry or or, or coins or, or other items But it it stands for proof of work because there are naturally occurring lumps of natural silver that you might pick up. But silver ore is is just another rock, really. You'd be hard pushed as a non-geologist even to identify it. You wouldn't. You wouldn't wouldn't see it as anything valuable in in that natural form. And it's proof of work because to transform that rock into silver... The rock has to be smashed into a powder. Uh, That powder then has to be heated somehow to a temperature in excess of a thousand degrees. And at that point, the silver that you want begins to disentangle itself so that you can just have pure silver or as pure silver as you can manage given whatever technology you have available to you. Then someone's got to fuss over the the newly acquired silver, uh, shape it into an ingot, And so by the time it ends up as a piece of silver, a block of silver, it has taken someone or a few people a lot of effort. And so so the silver's value, it stands for proof of other people's labour. And you can extend that out to other things. You know, a bag of wheat is proof of work. People had to plant the seed, weed the fields, protect them from birds, harvest them, collect the seed, put it in a bag. Oil has to be won from the earth, has to be drawn up from the the rock that it resides within. So all these things are valuable because they prove work, and money is proof of work. So we're only in moment number four here in the story of the world, but we are touching all the time on fundamentals that our ancestors stumbled upon or otherwise became aware of so long ago it's hard to put a date on it. Like writing, you know, we've talked about the introduction of the the discovery of writing and how that probably first of all used for keeping track, keeping track of things of value, keeping accounts. Kings like to know how much money they've got, how much wealth the kingdom has. We talked about the fact that writing could be used to lay down the law, literally, Hammurabi, the lawgiver. 
These are these are ancient notions, and likewise, money. People began to long ago, you know, to understand that there was power if you could control wealth. It's all about power. If you happen to be close by where copper is naturally occurring, or tin, those commodities are rare on the face of the earth, and people want them. And people will come to you, and they will give you other things in return for some of what you have. So if you can control that resource, then you've got power. It's all about power. And people realised early on that things of inherent value, things that were desirable could be exploited in the gaining and the holding and the manipulation of power. And when I say it's wide-ranging, this story, we, we go now to the, the Yap Archipelago, which is in the Western Pacific Ocean, a few dots of islands uh, in, the vastness of the, in the vastness of the Pacific. And on, on the islands of the Yap Archipelago, from a time so long ago, archaeologists struggled to pin it down. But let's say since at least the middle of the first millennium. So let, let's put a number on it for the sake of it, 500 AD. But it could be earlier. It's hard. It's, it's long ago that it's hard to know when this business started. But at some point in the distant past, the people of Yap began making great big donut-shaped boulders called Rai, R-A-I. The, as I say, they look like giant donuts. Well, in, in fact, they range in size. Some of the rye are, are small enough that you could hold in your hand, like a coin. But a little, a little donut shape, you know, a hula hoop, <laughs> in, the, in the case of the smallest ones. And then up to, the biggest of them are like 12 feet across. And they weigh as much as several parked cars. E enormously heavy, but always, always circular, carefully sculpted, and with a hole in the middle. The hole in the middle, in the case of the small ones, lets them be strung together so that you can have a few on a string. And in the case of the bigger ones, uh, it enables them to be you know, moved into position. The rye on the Yap archipelago are made from a rock called calcite, which is a kind of a metamorphic granite, really hard. Interestingly, there is no calcite occurring naturally in the Yap Archipelago. You might think they would have made these things out of a locally occurring stone, but no, and, it, 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 and that's part of the point. The nearest source of calcite for the Yapis is another island called Palau, 300 miles away across the open ocean. There are other sources of it, but most of the rye, we can tell geologically, were made from bedrock that was acquired on Palau, it may be the case that Yapese fishermen, eons ago, long time ago, maybe got maybe some of them got blown there by a storm. Maybe they got washed up and, and discovered the source of bedrock. Who knows? In any event, that's where they were in the habit of going. So they would go to the island, they would go to Palau, they would smash out as big a piece of calcite as they wanted, carve it into the distinctive donut shape, and then manhandle it down to the beach sling it between their canoes and get get these things back to the Yapis archipelago. An enormous and dangerous undertaking, you know, especially in the instance of the big ones that weigh several tonnes. You know, you can imagine how precarious that might be. And so the, the rye were brought back to Yap and installed. Now, you find these things all over. Some of them are on the beach, on the beaches of the coastline of the islands. Some are in clearings in the jungle. Some are in, in villages. Some of them are by trackways and paths. And the point is that once installed, they don't move. They stay put. And the Rai have functioned for the Yapis people for centuries, if not millennia, as money. Now, most transactions day to day would have been like simple barter. You know how that works. You know, so you would turn up somewhere and you say, you know, I've got these ten chickens, and I'll give you them if you give me that knife or whatever. You know, a simple exchange. But when it 
came to more significant transactions, the rye came into play. So let's say, for example, a young man or his family want to acquire a bride for one of their, their young men. And let's say they're in possession of a rye. They approach the family of the bride and in amongst the negotiations they say, we will give you the rye in exchange, that will be the bride price. So in exchange for you agreeing to this marriage, that which is ours at the moment, this rye, will become yours. And if that's agreed upon, the ownership of the rye changes, but the rye doesn't move. It stays where it's always been. And what, what happens is that now everyone knows, everyone on, everyone on the islands, they know the story of every rye. They know the, the long story of all the times and all the reasons why it was exchanged in the past. And the longer the story of transactions, the more interesting the rye and the greater its value. What also would play into that would be if uh, it had featured, let, let's say a, a marriage was arranged on the basis of the rye that was very happy or that produced a lot of strong children. That would add to its allure. You'd want to get your hands on such a rye. There would be other reasons, you know, where, the, where the, in the past where the tribes would be fighting amongst themselves. Let's say a, a, a brave warrior was killed and the people that killed him retained the body, but his family want him back for burial. They might exchange a rye. That would be a very significant transaction and a rye might come into play for that. And so there, in the long story of a rye, there might be the story of battles, all sorts of exchanges and, and transactions down through the through the history of the people. And everyone knows the significance of every stone and knows its story. And as you acquire it, if your family or you acquire the rye, you become built into its story. And so it goes on. And so the rye becomes more and more attractive. There's even a story, believe it or believe it not, of a team coming back from Palau with a rye slung between their canoes. They get caught in a storm and they're in, they're in danger of being overwhelmed. And so to save themselves, they cut the rye loose and it sinks to the seabed. They're not far from, from Yap when, they, when it happens, but nonetheless, it sinks to the bottom of the ocean. And they land and they tell the story. Well, the rye is where it is on the seabed and, it, and it's, it's still exchanged. No, no one ever sees this rye again, but to, to some extent, it's one of the most valuable rye on the Yapis archipelago because its story is so unusual. So this item that nobody has ever seen again is continuing to be transacted. Now, this is fascinating in all sorts of different ways, but not least because it has a, a startling similarity to the nature of the most modern currency exchanges that we have on the planet at the moment, which is to say cryptocurrencies. Let's say Bitcoin. There are innumerable cryptocurrencies now, but for the sake of it, let's talk about Bitcoin. Part of Bitcoin is a, what's called a distributed ledger, which is to say that everyone who's involved in Bitcoin can see the Bitcoin. They know who owns it. They know every transaction. They can see on the distributed ledger when it has changed hands. So they know who used to own it, they know who owns it now. But of course, nobody ever touches the Bitcoin. It doesn't exist in any kind of physical, absolute sense. But that doesn't stop it being valuable. And that doesn't stop it changing hands. So a Bitcoin has, at the fundamental level, a great similarity to the great big lumps of calcite that are transacted for in the Yapis archipelago. Their story is available for everyone who's in the blockchain, everyone who's in the distributed ledger, shares the knowledge about where it's been, who's owned it, when and why it was transacted. So it means that we think we're very, well, we are very sophisticated in the, in the modern era, but Bitcoin, the most modern form of wealth transaction, has about it something that our ancestors realised thousands of years ago that you don't need to move these things about. You don't even need to see them. You just need to understand who owns it and who doesn't. What was mine is now yours. 
or what was yours is now mine. I mean, it's it's much like most people when they get paid today, salaried people, they don't re- they don't often nowadays get handed a brown envelope full of twenty pound notes. I suppose some people do, but broadly speaking, what happens is that your employer presses some buttons, and a number in your bank's computer changes to show a, a different a number against your name, slightly more. And that's there for a wee while. And then you go to Marks and Spencer's food hall or to the Apple store and you buy something. And that number on the computer for for your bank changes again. A little bit less for you, a, a little bit more for Apple or for M&S food hall. But you don't actually touch the money. But it doesn't matter. Because everyone involved in that chain of transactions just knows that the money is changing hands, although no one ever actually holds it in their hand. It's that way in which some of those ideas that we consider to be modern aren't, or or at the same time as being modern, or, or having their latest iteration in the modern world. They're predicated upon and founded upon ideas that our species understood long ago. When the Europeans were first in North America, they encountered the local indigenous people using wampum as the basis of of some exchanges. They used barter, but they also used wampum. Primarily the women of the tribes would gather shells like whelk and and other shells from from the beach. And then laboriously they would grind these down into cylindrical shapes of black and white and dark and light. And then wooden drills with quartz tips were used to uh, drill holes through each of them so that they could be sewn together, braided together, linked together into decorative items, really. But as well as being decorative, some of them told stories of the tribe. The patterning of light and dark and and different shapes and whatever meant that there was a, a language there in the wampum. So treaties between tribes or or battles between tribes or or significant moments were told in these strips of wampum. And they were proof of work. Obviously, everyone understood that a great deal of effort had gone into the making of them. And the older they were and and the longer the story they told and the more illustrious the story that was told, the more valuable was the wampum. So when the Europeans in the 15th and 16th centuries and 17th centuries arrived amongst these people. They came with some gold, but before long, most of the gold was away because they had to send it back on ships that were coming back to the old country in return for commodities. Uh, so what are they going to exchange? How are they going to keep the, the whole business of, of the economy going? Well, they get involved in the trade of wampum. So they start, they start, they get involved. And all of this works well. You know, the exchanges are going on. Now some of the Europeans hold some of the wampum. The indigenous people have them. These things move back and forth. But then, after a few decades, the Europeans imported machines for mass producing the beads. Okay? So instead of being made by hand laboriously, they were now being churned out cheaply. It's like quantitative easing. It's like suddenly there's excessive amounts of what had previously been a rare commodity. And almost overnight, the the trading value of wampum fell through the floor. And what began to happen was the artificially mass-produced wampum stayed in circulation and people uh, hoarded the real stuff. So the wampum that had been made by hand that that were decades or hundreds of years old started getting squirreled away as being too valuable to get involved in these shoddy transactions. So the value of wampum collapsed for exactly the same reasons that a lot of our currencies have been devalued by quantitative easing. I mean, something like 80% of all the US dollars in circulation at the moment have been made in the last two years, printed in the last two years. 80% of all the dollars in circulation in the world are less than two years old. And now the dollar is perilously devalued. But the same is true, that that quantitative easing, that devaluing has affected the euro, it's affected the pound sterling, and currencies around the world have stumbled into a a trap that was first realised by European traders in North America, you know, working with these strips of 
carefully produced shells. You know, so that old adage about there being nothing new under the sun, we're constantly reminded of the truth of that. It's fascinating, isn't it, that it was happening in different places at different times all across the world. Yeah, yeah, because people face, people have always faced the same challenges. And, and over and over again, variations of the same solution are found over and over again. Now we get to Cappadocia, that territory that is, you know, more or less Turkey in the ancient world. Well, the moment, if you like, the, 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 the significant moment in the story of the world, moment number four, happens, for the sake of argument, in Cappadocia, around about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. Now, in Cappadocia, people had identified a natural source of silver. So they were, they were already practised in that technology that I just described, that idea of, well, either naturally occurring ingots, but in large part it was a case of getting hold of the ore, smashing it down, getting the powder, heating the powder to a thousand degrees centigrade, and then, you know, manufacturing a, a, a block of silver. Well, it occurred to someone, here's the moment, it occurred to one of them, and it must have occurred to somebody, it must have, the, the spark of, of inspiration must have occurred in some individual brain at some point. And for the sake of argument, it seems to have happened about 2,000 years BC. Someone realised that they didn't need to lumber about with these big bars of silver. You know, this is, I mean, this is, this is older than the Yapis calcite rye. This is way back. But, you know, rather than fill your rucksack with silver bars and carry them around all the time, it occurred to somebody that they could just be kept in a safe place, banked, for, for, for want of any other word. And again, someone would understand that the silver that had been mine is now yours in exchange for whatever, a bride price, the settlement of a debt, buying a certain amount of wheat or buying a few head of cattle or whatever. You don't have to hand over the silver. What happens is there's an understanding that that silver, which is in a safe place, which was previously mine, is now yours. And it will be yours without moving, without you necessarily having to touch it, until you transact with it again. And then it becomes owned by somebody else. So it is like the rye, really. It's always the same. This is why I would credit this as a significant moment. The super rich now, you know, the, the Bezoses and Musks and, and the Gates. If Jeff Bezos, I mean, Jeff Bezos is personally richer than Hungary. Right? You know, Bill Gates is richer than Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, all added together. If these guys were to sort of go to the bank and say, give me my money, no bank could. These guys are worth hundreds of billions of pounds. Now, no bank could provide them with the necessary banknotes or even the necessary gold ingots. So there's an element of trust or you might even say suspension of disbelief. We all just accept that Elon Musk is the richest person on planet Earth. But he doesn't have to show anybody his great big pile of gold coins. It's notional. We, we accept, and he transacts, and he sends rockets up into space and lands them back on Earth again and, and buys Twitter for whatever it was, you know, $40 billion. And that transaction happens, but he doesn't, he doesn't have to wheelbarrow $40 billion to the headquarters of Twitter to make that happen. There's just an understanding Basically, what it boils down to, the moment that we're talking about, is we understand collectively and we never see the wealth of that person. We just know it to be true. And that understanding and that means by which, that basis upon which transactions happen all around the world is ancient. We've been at it for in excess of 4,000 years, all the way from bars of silver in Cappadocia to bitcoins in a virtual wallet. It's all the same. And you 
can see how it must have sped up the development of societies because suddenly they're able to do so many more things rather than carting around all this yeah. money. Yeah, you can. I mean, that's where you get that's where you get promissory notes, which become banknotes. I promise to pay the bearer to the value of whatever ten pounds, fifty pounds, and whatever. It's just a piece of paper. And thousands of years ago, you could have done similar. The the silver stays or the gold stays where it is. And you might you might hand someone a piece of clay, with in cuneiform on it an understanding that that person in receipt of the piece of clay is also the owner of the gold or the silver or the cattle. It simplifies the nature of transactions endlessly. And and, and it's simply the case that some things are too difficult to trade with. Let's say you've got a thousand head of cattle. Well, I mean, you can't exchange half a cow. Well, you could, but it's now dead. It's now butchered meat. But if you've got gold, you can break a gold bar up. You can divide it down, right down to individual grains of gold, and transact on that basis. And also something like gold and silver, to store the same value as a herd of cattle, it it requires a much smaller space. You know, you can keep the same value of gold uh, as, say, a thousand head of cattle, you know, in a small box. And then having simplified it that far, rather than the gold changing hands all the time, everyone just agrees that the gold sits where it is. And you just understand, on the basis of financial instruments, pieces of paper, that what had been yours is now mine. And when I want to move it on again, I'll exchange it. But you never see the gold, you never see the silver. And that understanding, that concept occurred to someone in a particular moment, for the sake of argument, in Cappadocia, 4,000 years ago. Writing, counting, bureaucracy, farming, cities, pyramids. By the year 2000 BC, civilization was already on the march, aided, abetted and driven by two simple crops, olive trees, and grapevines. An incredible palace was built at Gnosis as prosperity poured into Crete, a labyrinth below, home to the monstrous Minotaur. Next time in my love letter to the world. To help support this podcast and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment vodcasts every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter. My YouTube channel is simply called the Neil Oliver Channel. And to help build this podcast, please tell your friends about it, get them listening, and write a review to convince the online crowd to join us. For further reading about these moments in time, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the World in 100 Moments, and it's published by Trans World. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the World is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is composed by Milo McKinnon. Social media and YouTube producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucy and Archie and Teddy. Finance is taken care of by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. Thanks for listening. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. (laughs) 